Welcome to Smash the Class, a podcast that discusses topics in education from an anarchist perspective. As we recently decided to change our name to better reflect how we hope our group can help, this project is part of the Anarchist Pedagogies Collective, which seeks to create a space for anyone interested in anarchism and education, regardless of their expertise or background. For our fourth episode, we decided to record a conversation between four members of the organizing group. This includes Sonia, Yotim, Idzi, and myself, Nicole. Our topic this time was discussing how we understand expertise and authority and how we may need to approach both things in our learning processes and as anarchists. The original impetus for this conversation was to discuss what was a monthly event that we'd like to revitalize again, Joyful Resistance. We originally build it as a space for anarchist educators to sometimes commiserate, but mostly to share their experiences and successes in building alternative learning spaces. However, we noticed that a lot of people kept coming to us as if we were experts, and to an extent expecting that there was an expert who had all the answers. This isn't inherently a bad thing, and we're not passing judgment on people for doing this, but it was something that we were uncomfortable with as we were doing our best to learn from others and to create a space where more people could come together and share information, knowledge, and experiences with others. Before we get into the conversation, I'd like to clarify a few things. We reference a few different presentations, podcast episodes, and events, and all of these will be linked in the show notes. We're also looking to start Joyful Resistance back up in some form, so if you'd like to join us, you can check in on our Discord server and let us know how we can facilitate that collaborative environment or how you want to participate and help. Lastly, this episode should have a companion or two coming out at a later date, so keep an eye out for those. With all of that said, let's get into it. I think this is the first time that I'm actually speaking on a podcast episode. I think it is the first time you're going to speak on one, <laughs> other than just listening to it. Let this be the last. Nobody needs to hear me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're here today to talk about expertise. Woohoo! Um, Maybe the best way to start would be to give a little bit of a background on why we're uh, we've chosen to record this episode. So would anyone like to start us off with a bit of background? Someone intro it, not me. <laughs> Sonia is pointing, I guess, at me. <laughs> or no, you, you can do it. So you can do it. Oh, okay. Uh, well. Uh, The background for this podcast today was actually that uh, for soon two years ago, we started this anarchist pedagogist collective and one of the, well, one of the the groups we have had is the, the joyful resistance group, both in English and Spanish. And, um, during our internal conversations in the collective or at least in the organizing group so we thought that this was going to be a kind of a a group to 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 do some some mutual aid but especially for the emotional part of what it means to be in a learning process not necessarily just for teachers or or yeah but actually for anybody who's interested in these learning processes uh, what we soon found out is that perhaps uh, <laughs> the idea of why we were having this, uh, these groups, these joyful resistance groups, perhaps it wasn't explicitly explained or, or yeah, what, what is it we wanted to facilitate with these groups. And the idea was actually this, just to make, to have some kind of spaces to get to know each other and create networks, community to support each other because a lot of, well, anarchists and and in this case, teachers or educators or yeah, anybody in learning processes, sometimes we feel very alone because we are 
alone <laughs> in our spaces sometimes. But what we what we found out is that both in the English speaking group and the Spanish speaking group is that actually people was not not explicitly, but actually they expected us to show some kind of expertise in different topics. And this is actually the background, right? Because uh, we, the, the ones that are in the coordinating group, we couldn't understand how it came that people thought that we were any kind of experts. I mean, of course, some of us actually are trained educators, that's correct, uh, but that doesn't mean we are more experts than anybody else Then can, can be interested in you know, uh, developing and getting to know how is it to be in learning processes that are based on anarchist principles. And there's a lot of different ways of actually uh, doing this. So this is the background. Today, we are going to share <laughs> what it was, uh, the, 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 the idea at the beginning, how we have thought that it has to meet people in other ways, perhaps even, perhaps even in other platforms because we started doing it at Zoom and now we are more in, in Discord. But how, how can we as, as anarchists actually try to engage in much more self-organized spaces where the idea of authority and expertise is also practiced from anarchist principles? So that's hopefully what we can start talking about today. And it's not for sure that we are going to come <laughs> with any recipe or a final idea, but actually try to, yeah, uh, to try to talk about these topics and how can we continue creating community among us? Yeah, I just want to add to that, Sonia, that like we've been talking to, about this for a while, actually, before this podcast has been recorded, but, but just now with your intro, um, something came up to me, which is this, the process that you've, that you've, um, described that you know i was also a part of so like i experienced it was in itself a learning opportunity we are kind of looked upon sometimes i think as a collective um as if we know what we're doing not only as educators although people in this collective are way more trained as educators than i am <laughs> for sure but we are also kind of looked upon as like trained in being an online collective which i think we also are not not really some of us are better at it than others, definitely better than me, but not really that way. And I think this experience that you've described was it was a really good um, example of us not really being that great at it, but just trying to do something um, and admitting that we don't really know to the extent that we maybe should, or at least to the extent that people think we do, um, know how to do this. And we're kind of learning as we go along. So I, th I think that's important to also mention that in kind of a meta way. And another just quick comment, hopefully this will be a part one of two, maybe more, where other people from the collective might join in and talk about their perspective and expertise. Um, if you are listening to this and you have not shared in a recording and you want to, come at us. We're, we're, we're happy to, to, to host <laughs> you and have some fun. So that was just like my brief tangent <laughs> on that. Us. No, I think that's actually a really great thing to kind of highlight is the fact that we are not like while we have a lot of knowledge and a lot of ability or um, expertise or whatever, however people want to kind of think about it, like, there's a lot that we're still trying to work out on how to, you know, structure things on what people might actually want to see. Um, but definitely kind of looking back at what Sonia was saying is like the one there's like that one big question of like what is it that actually makes an expert and why is it that we keep going back to like experts um and also like you know the constant battle that we have as anarchists but even within a lot of other radical thoughts which tends to be that whole fighting between like authority and expertise and trying to really understand like what it is that we're trying to accomplish or what we want to accomplish or like how many possibilities we have to accomplish 
a goal because like one of the biggest things I keep running into, um, particularly recently for myself has been just people looking at like, oh, you gave one solution. Uh, clearly that must be the only solution to this problem. And it kind of harkens to that whole idea of like, well, actually there's lots of people here. We need to have many, <laughs> like many solutions that actually go with this. Um, so perhaps we can start off with like talking about what, you know, what is an expert, what makes an expert and how do we view this? I'll let someone else start off. <laughs> well, um, one thing that occurs to me, I think uh, in the general population, right, experts are considered people who, who have credentials, people who, uh, you know, are, are academics, people who are appropriately trained um, in, in their field. And that's one of these things that um, I feel like anarchists often say that they reject, right? Just this sort of claim that we push back against this. But then if you actually look at, at who's held up as experts within the anarchist community, of course, you'll often see people who um, have, you know, higher degrees, people who are meeting the same expert, uh, expectations for expertise as a general population. So I feel like there's kind of a disconnect there between uh, claimed, I don't know if values is the right word, but, uh, and what people actually show in their behavior. So I think that's sort of something that needs to be challenged, this sort of traditional idea of what expertise is and how it's gained. I definitely see that a lot with like, as much as I do like his writing style, uh, anarchists cling to David Graeber. <laughs> like so many, particularly in North America, I see this and even a bit in like English speaking countries, but like just that clinging to him and you're kind of going, but he, he, he is known as the anarchist academic and, <laughs> you know, I, I often see that quite a lot. And it is one of those weird places where we aren't actually challenging, you know, what it means. Um, I also highly agree with the credentialing thing because uh, the whole idea of like, because, you know, I'm a teacher, I went through the whole process of becoming one, going into debt in a university to become a teacher. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, that whole idea just that I know every single thing that I'm doing. And it's a very bizarre position to be in where it's like, I don't actually know everything. Like I do have an understanding of, you know, um, child psychology or teenagers, psych uh, not teenager psychology, but the psychology of teenagers, because, you know, otherwise that's a weird phrase, but <laughs> like, I have an understanding of these things. Um, but it's also stuff that's not really even taught in the programs and it's stuff that you pick up along the way and you start learning how like different kids work in different ways and how all these different methods are. And so it's like that whole idea of having a credential, like, yeah, I have my, you know, graduate diploma of secondary education, but it's like, that didn't prepare me at all for working with kids. <laughs> or to teach or to do anything like I really don't feel like that even prepared me as a ed, like a you know a quote proper unquote educator I guess that what happened also in the in the J4 resistance group is that we tend to think very individualistic still right that the expertise uh, role, the expert role, sometimes we see it as one person that has actually a lot of knowledge about something specific or has a, a specific training on something. But but if, if we are going to think as, as, a, as a collective, right? And this is what, what anarchists aim to, right? I have a, a common uh, knowledge. Actually, the, the idea might be that to share that expertise that it cannot be just academic. It can't because there's a lot of people that have no academic training and still they are wonderful educators, right? Because education is not about training, it's about the intention and the care you put in it and how you get to organize with more people. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, a collective action. It's a direct action. So in that matter, it's actually very interesting to see. And to me, that's how your Tom said earlier, it was actually a, a learning process also for us because we were surprised 
that people came into the space and we were in the space and somebody, they were asking, and it's natural, you know, to, to ask for literature or, or other authors or even spaces, you know, educational spaces we knew. Uh, but thinking that sometimes there was actually several people there and all of us have some kind of experience, right? And that matters. I mean, it's important then how to see how we build these experiences together and what we get out of it. Because sure, I mean, I'm sure I read some books that, uh, you know, can be interesting for Easy and, you know, the other way around. And that's always nice, right? To, to get tips and to know what we can read. But actually the, the learning processes again is an action and how this expertise can be done if we don't practice and if we keep on having this, this heroic idea of uh, there's in, in the first place, just formally trained people who have some kind of expertise and authority in the field, that makes no sense. And number two, that is just done for based on some individuals. That is something we really have to not just rephrase, but actually re rethink and start doing it in another way, right? Because it doesn't help us in the situation we are at now, like historically speaking, we are going to hard times, you know, in the in the really near future. It's already hard. It's been hard for a lot of years already. But the thing is that if we really want to make changes, this I think that we cannot cling on that idea of this individual trained academic expertise in anarchist or radical spaces. It's actually stopping us. It it really does. And just to follow up on that, I completely agree with you, Sonia. I would would like to maybe um, maybe break up this this thing that we call like academic expertise and and kind of talk about maybe a little bit of what that really is, as opposed to what I think a lot of people think it is. So at at the worst of times, academic expertise is basically a person with a professor next to his name, usually his, because that's the world that we are in right now. Um, uh, telling us what to do and because they have a title, then we should listen to them, right? That's the worst, the worst thing. And and we see it quite a bit, actually. Like, I see a lot of times people, you know, argue with me and they go, oh, but he is a professor at whatever Ivy League university. And then I go, yeah, but he's saying stupid things, but he's a professor <laughs> at, all right, whatever. Um, that's like the worst case. But actually, I want to talk about the, the best case scenario because that I think is more productive. And that is, a person, whoever they are, did some research and came up with something, a model, a, an understanding of something, whatever. And and I want to limit what I'm saying to specifically um, education or even sociology, because that's kind of the realm that we are talking on, about. So I'm not talking about, say, I don't know, physicists also, because I just don't understand them at all. <laughs> <laughs> don't. They're so strange to me. Um, uh, but, but what does that mean to be an expert in a good way, I guess, in academia, um, uh, uh, in, in, in things like sociology or, or, or education, it means that you went out and you tried to do a thing. You tried to be an educator and you came back with some knowledge about the experience that you've had. That's all that it means. And you were able to somehow tell others about what you have done and what you have experienced. That's it, which is what all of us do. <laughs> it's not new it's not novel it's not unique to academic spaces it's just in academic spaces we we because i am part of those spaces whether unfortunately or not we get the funding to be able to come back and say a thing but that's it there's nothing more or nothing more special about this and when you think about like the great my like the people that we kind of sometimes probably wrongfully assign like almost supernatural importance in anarchist history, people like Kropotkin, who I mention way too many times, or Bakunin, or all these great men with great beards. At the best case scenario, they went, met some people, came back and said, look what those people are doing. We should be doing that too. That's it. That's all they did, <laughs> right? And we have to, to, to and that's not a bad thing. I'm not saying that it's a bad thing, but I think we, we need to, Put that in the right context. It's a person who did, a, who went, experienced a thing, came back and told us about the thing they experienced. That's it. To the extent that that's useful to us, great. Let's do it. 
to the extent that it's not useful to us, let's, you know, push the brakes a little bit here and talk about what the experience of what the lesson that they've learned from this. One of the things that I've, for example, noticed because I've had a Kropotkin era, so I was reading a lot about the guy. I was interested in him. And, you know, he came to Canada, where I currently am, and and, and had some obs observations about the status of Canada in the late 19th century. And a lot of the things that he said were actually kind of dumb. Not that smart. <laughs> but that's a guy's perception of a situation that he was in. And we need to, to be able to, like, not throw everything that he did because of a stupid thing that he said. But also not to just accept everything as if it's true because it's a great guy with a beard. So, and when we approach other experts, experts that we value, I think it's important for us to understand how they become experts and how other people who they had experiences with contributed to their expertise, whether it's children they worked with or other educators or just other people. Um, those conversations, those communications, those relationships are what made them into the experts that we think they are. And that is, I think, the only reasonable way to think about them. And that's kind of a way that I, at least for me, calms down the big impression of the big guy with the big ideas. I don't know. Does that, did I just ramble for a long time? I'm sorry. <laughs> I say I just really like the idea of a theory being like great man with a beard theory, uh, <laughs> as opposed to just like the whole great man one, um, <laughs> because yeah, it is very often that they do have a beard. But I think the other part to that is also looking at how formalized it is as a system, um, and how rarely can we actually break free of that kind of like very formalized, hierarchical, highly structured system. Um, namely the whole idea where it's like, you know, you're saying that like the people, they left and they went and observed a thing, which is, you know, I love that about, you know, the human species. We go outside, we watch people, we learn and we understand like the situation. But then like they have these whole vigorous things about like, okay, you have now you've observed these people come back and write this horribly formalized report that like five people in their entire life either can or will read um, can because it's usually so dry, you kind of want to like hit your head into a brick wall or like also can because it's often behind a paywall and you're sort of going like, well, this is awesome. Uh, no one's ever going to read this except like the three people who actually care about it uh, <laughs> or the four people who email me and actually can like, I can send it to them. Uh, <laughs> stuff like that. And like that whole idea of like just how formalized that is and how limiting that is because there's a certain structure that people have to engage in. And because like my background is history, um, which is, you know, like when I did do my whole academic stuff, my bachelor's degree was in history. I did a bachelor's degree in anthropology at the same time. And one of the things that it just stick with me is how often my history professors were yelling at me for writing papers that were too anthropological. <laughs> it's like, there's too much culture in this history. And you're kind of like, well, I'm sorry, but like, we are humans, that's inextricable. <laughs> and so that whole idea of like very formalized systems and like what they have to look like, like how anthropology needs to look different from history and how that needs to look different from psychology, from sociology, from education for some reason, which I think is a very bizarre concept considering how often education takes from everyone. Um, <laughs> and just this whole idea of, you know, part of that going out and observing then becomes that whole, well, I'm collecting this information to now like create an object, a artifact, um, something that I can then, I don't know, my university can sell or someone can hide in a archive somewhere that you'll never see. <laughs> so it's like, I think that bit as well, like that kind of gets like lost in that whole thing where it's like, yeah, there are academics who are doing like really important, really cool work. But then, like, often we're like, where is it? Where did it go? <laughs> yes, and <laughs> that, in, that exact thing where it's hidden from you either because of paywalls or because of terrible language being used, you know, very inaccessible, is part of why 
people look at men with beards and with such reverence. I don't understand what they're doing. So clearly it's important. And let, let's let them decide for us. That's like part of the mechanism. And it's more rhetorical than real. It's just it's the rhetoric of academia. Um, and and it's, it's definitely harmful. One of the reasons why I have so much hard time with physicists is because I have friends who are physicists. And when they let me read their their journal articles i was like what the, this is not english there's no this is not language this is just gibberish signs on a page i cannot understand any of this oh well then you're not enough of a physicist okay then bye <laughs> not interested let's walk away from this and i'm sure that it's the same for people from outside reading stuff that i do or the people that i know do and it's it's a re it's genuinely a real problem that we we definitely have to deal with um, I feel yeah. like that kind of ties into, uh, uh, or I guess naturally leads to the problem that that we still see of there being uh, people sorted into two classes, right? There are teachers and there are people who are taught, and those are two separate categories. Um, yes. And so that really, you know, runs through everything, and that's I think it's tied to the professionalization of uh, of education of educators, which I think is a real problem. That there really is this distinction made, and that's kind of how you have people coming into these spaces. Like, okay, if I'm going to to be learning, then someone has to be managing it, and the person who is managing it should be an educator, whether that's an academic, a trained teacher. It's a, a it's seen their learning as only happening within hierarchies and with those two separate classes of people. Um, when, of course, really, you know, as has already been brought up, everyone has knowledge and skills to share and everyone has things they don't know, things that they can learn from others. And uh, it, it's really, a, there's really a need to get over the idea that, that there are separate groups of people who, you know, knowledge havers and those who lack knowledge <laughs> um, and see it more as a, a, an exchange between equals and as uh, something which is constantly shifting depending on the context and depending on the topic that there's going to be people who know more and less and that that's something fluid. There's not uh, discrete categories of students and teachers. I very much agree with that. And I think that's why actually uh, in traditionally speaking and historically speaking, anarchists have seen uh, learning as a lifelong process that we do together. I mean, I think that's the key actually for what uh, it's is saying, both that we ha should be should be very consciously anti-hierarchical. And actually that these two roles of being a teacher and a student they are not separated. We are all learners all the time. And that's, I think, it's a, a part of um, perhaps why it felt kind of weird for some of us to think that people were joining the joyful resistance groups uh, expecting this expertise, while perhaps we are very aware that we are learning. I mean, when we started the collective, it's it was, I mean, the the it, we wanted to get to know other anarchist educators and, and learners, right? I mean, it's um, we never meant to be kind of a non-academic space with that kind of informal expertise. That wasn't the idea. I mean, we saw ourselves as, and we see ourselves as learners, and we would love to do it together with people, right? And I guess also what you're naming is it's really important. It's something we have to work on with ourselves, Right. That yes, sometimes we we go into spaces, and uh, at least in my case, uh, I've been. I think it's important to remain humble, regardless of how many titles we have on the walls. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's just a piece of paper that doesn't say anything about the skills or how you care about people. Because if we are in revolutionary learning processes, we actually have to care about people. Mm -hmm. Right. And do this direct action and mutual aid that we always talk about, but actually on, on everyday basis is actually not that easy to do. And especially when we are in formal learning spaces. Um, I'm an academic as well. And I always, always get comments that I care too much about my students. That makes <laughs> no sense at all. <laughs> I do 
I do care about my students and I see them as my companion companions of learning processes. I tell them exactly that explicitly. But then uh, some of my colleagues think, of course, that I'm not authoritarian enough. Well, because I never meant <laughs> I don't want to be authoritarian. <laughs> that's number one. And number two, I'm very clear that, again, the, the learning process being in a classroom, it's a, it, again, is a process where we are together in that learning. Right. I mean, that's it. And especially, again, thinking that at least um, some of us, we, we really have to, to remain also very aware that when we are in these learning processes, uh, it might happen that we, we have to actually be aware that most of us, when we, if we go to formal schooling, we get trained to obey. This is another thing that just hangs over time. I mean, this is a problem. I think it's really a problem. And this is when it comes to the idea that we go into certain uh, areas or spaces and we expect that somebody with kind of an authority or formal expertise will tell us what to do. That's why we read books. Oh, this person is really right, this smart and has this kind of position. And I'm sure they use a lot of time about this, perhaps, but not necessarily. And, and when it comes to anarchism, we have to see the integral part of education. We cannot just trust, and that's what I've been doing the last 20 years. I don't trust just the people that look at revolutionary process just from books. That is not working. That is what, that's what we don't have any advance. Actually, I think it's much more interesting. And that was, again, the idea with the Jeff resistance groups was to know what people are doing, doing as an action. What are you doing out there? And there's a lot of people doing wonderful things. And yeah, yeah sure, sometimes it's like a seed. Sometimes it, you know, it lasts for two months and sometimes it lasts for several years. It doesn't matter, but it has an impact. And that's what we wanted to get to know, to get to know each other, you know, and to see how can we support each other? How can we join other, uh, you know, stuff going on out there? But then again, I actually, I, I, experience this unconscious uh, unconscious challenge of these authority and hierarchies in our anarchy spaces uh, like like a a big uh, it, it's a big challenge and it should be spoken about and that's what that's what we are doing now but it will be wonderful that also other people start talking about because we live in the, a time of misinformation of increasing fascism and we know that they are really good at propaganda <laughs> we know that and so it's a question how are we going to strengthen ourselves as movements and organizations and groups to get this collective knowledge and to build it together right and of course, it might happen that we can rotate these expertise roles or whatever. But again, all of us have said it now that nobody builds knowledge by themselves. This is, again, an individualistic idea. And we have to be very careful of not being extractivist because that's not what we should be doing. But actually, yeah, uh, trying to make people understand that they also have the experience and the power, you know, to, to be in revolutionary processes anyway. Or either you have a credential or not, it doesn't matter. It makes no difference at all. The difference is what you do and how you do it and why are you doing it. It's like, like the didactics behind it, <laughs> if you'd like to. But that's, that's I think, it's, it's the important elements to talk about. I like that you said, like, sometimes it's just a seed. Sometimes it's a little tree in Greece. Um, <laughs> but also a couple of the things that I was thinking about, like, first, you said that, like, you get accused of caring too much. I have literally had conversations with principals where they have sat there going like, well, it seems like your relationships with students are way more important than what you're doing in class. And you're kind of like, because in order for all of us to learn, uh, for them to trust me, for me to trust them, for us to be like on the same page, to build an understanding. It's like, 
I have to build a relationship with these, like these people. And, you know, that's, the, that's kind of the basis of society is that I have to build a, you know, a fucking relationship with people just so that way we all understand like what Patreon people know who I am. So it's like, you know, all of you understand a lot of my intentions, whether or not I say them because you all know me. Um, perhaps not many people listening do, but you know, obviously, like, the people that you work closely with, they understand you because you've worked hard to build those kind of trusting relationships. And you've put that effort in and people have shown you uh, who they are and what they care about and what they can do. And you've done the same with them, like that whole mutual, like, self care, that whole mutual support, all of that. Um, the other part too, is that like, one of the things I feel like, uh, particularly with the joyful resistance, but just in general, is that people are scared of mistakes. And we are so afraid to make these mistakes. And it's like people will come in um, either to us. I've had these conversations like offline with other anarchists where I live who want to build like, you know, reading groups and learning spaces. Um, I've had this conversation with someone else we did a podcast with, Carl. Um, so we've talked about this quite a lot. But it's like people are just afraid to make mistakes where it's like, you know what? I want to build this space. Like, what is the perfect way to build a perfect anarchist school? And it's like, well, I mean, the first step is to remove the word perfect from your vocabulary because there is no, there's no fucking way you can have a perfect anything, <laughs> you know? Um, and it's like, people don't seem to get that. And I see this a lot also uh, with how we perceive schools, like schooling, um, academia is another one. Um, I think there's been a lot of conversation, particularly around like, you know, fraudulent data. And it's like, people will not talk about like, why do these people keep creating fraudulent data? And it's like, well, maybe the whole idea that they have to be perfect in academia and have a perfect record and have these, you know, fantastic pieces of work, that kind of factors in, like we've created this system where they feel like they have to be perfect. Um, and we've been doing that for, way too long on a person's life. So like you go through K to 12 and how often are kids in school being told you have to do this perfectly. You have to get perfect grades. You have to get perfect this, perfect that. You have to have the perfect resume. And like, if we're just so like, we've lost this ability to be like, okay, I can screw up. I can make a mistake. Like I can do something wrong. And life will go on and we can rectify it and we can do that. Like all of us can work together to fix that. And I feel like that's just a huge part in like our learning process, like both in terms of like joyful resistance that a lot of people are coming and going like, how can we do this? Like, what is the correct way of handling this situation? It's like, well, correct depends on who is in the room. <laughs> like, You know, it's like correct for me is not going to be correct for like Yotam, correct for like, Idzi is not going to be the same for you, Sonia. So, you know, like, <laughs> we might share some commonalities, but like, obviously, there's no correct way of doing this. And I just feel like we're stuck in this track where it's like, we have to do everything correctly and perfectly. No mistakes, no failure, no screw ups, all of that. And that's like, one of the things I just, I keep noticing so often, like, I just, I think I'm noticing it a lot more <laughs> recently. But yeah, that was some of the other things that you kind of really made me think of, particularly with that whole idea that learning is a lifelong process. Like we just forget, um, again, we're trained into thinking. It's like, uh, it used to be that we were trained into thinking once we hit grade 12, well, I'm done. I can now go on to live my life. And now it's more like, oh, well, I've finished what my master's thesis and now I can go on to live my life. Like, <laughs> like it keeps going on and on and getting longer. So, <laughs> so, so just to pick up on that, um, there actually two things that kind of you made me think about um one is and this is not a judgment more of kind of a an observation that here in this collective but also in other spaces we can we need to also be able to help others make mistakes so we need to make our spaces open to the point where people are able to make mistakes and come back from them and i think that's really really important because in some particularly anarchist spaces making a mistake could get you screwed up can get you fucked up can get you out of the door 
forever, even if you just really try to do a thing. Now, some, of course, there are limits to everything, but I think we also have a lesson here that we need to learn about how to let others make mistakes and, 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 and how that process happens and how they can come back from that. And also what qualifies as a mistake and oh, like yeah. how, like having those discussions be able to go like, okay, you know what, like you brought the wrong thing to the wrong event or you did this, you did that, like you're what, whatever, that's cool. But you know, like this, uh, you, you're consistently like harassing people. Stop, go away, get out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree. But, and also to differentiate between what is a mistake and what is just a disagreement. Like sometimes I might say something that you disagree with and that's okay. That's fine. Um, but sometimes I genuinely make mistakes. Often I I make mistakes. <laughs> Often, every time someone says something to me and is like, "Hey, you're wrong," I say, "Yes, that is absolutely always the case. I am always wrong until I'm right. That's just <laughs> how it is, and that kind of helps along." But another, but the, the, to, to just continue on this path, there is, it is incredibly liberating to get away from the position of an expert. There is, to me personally, there's nothing more stressful than being called the expert. Oh God, <laughs> I need to be like so good at what I do. Whereas, hey, I studied this for a while, came up with something that I think is maybe cool. Want to hear about it? Maybe I'll make a mistake. Maybe not. Maybe this is completely useless. Maybe it's the coolest thing ever. Let's talk about it. <laughs> That is what I prefer and what I feel that helps me, but also that creates better conversations as opposed to, I am going to tell you what is correct and you will listen and we will get out of this where you know more. <laughs> Prove it on a test. That seems to me like a lot of pressure, not only on others, but also on, on myself as kind of the, the, the expert. So like by, by opening up the spaces in, in this way, we are not only um, participating in, in revolutionary practice, which I agree with, but we are also helping ourselves to just live a more healthy life. Picking up on the sort of ideas of, of perfection or people, you know, that, that whole type of thing. Um, I think something that really gets in the way for people is that, uh, as you were saying, Sonia, people are really sort of trained to, to, to obey, to, you know, to look to that external authority. And I don't think many people are very good at recognizing when they themselves are learning or recognizing their own growth, because there's this sort of idea that learning only happens when it's overseen by an expert authority, when there's someone there to evaluate it and quantify that learning. So that's sort of what people have been trained to look for, to look for that external validation that you are learning here right now, you're learning and this is what you learned. And um, to really kind of uh, uh, expect that from others instead of uh, engaging kind of personal reflection and recognizing just how often they're learning communally with others on their own, just in all parts of life. Um, I think people have a hard time kind of recognizing that in themselves. Yeah, I would agree. We don't really spend a lot of time reflecting on things that we've done. Um, I mean, I'm sure there are lots of people who do spend lots of time reflecting or, uh, in my case, overthinking everything, uh, which is a very ADHD trait where it's like, I said one wrong thing and now I'm going to like hyper fixate on that one wrong thing for like the next month minimum. Um, <laughs> but... but overwhelmingly I don't think we really teach people or not even teach but like teach ourselves how to reflect upon like what has happened or even how to do like a mutual reflection where it's like I might have one way of thinking about it but maybe I'm unsure so I need to be like okay hey Itzy could we talk about this to see like how you know like we um, both understand this situation and you might come away saying like, no, like this is fantastic and da, da 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 And I'm over here like going, okay, so like, all right, like I don't have to be so negative. And at least it helps me kind of like find a more even keeled view of something where I can actually just kind of go, all right, yeah, I got it. <laughs> and I don't think we spend a lot of time doing that. And we often tend to be, um, and again, this kind of goes back to like how academia structures, we tend to be very critical. We tend to sit there and look for the flaws um, 
like this is something that I know like it it drove me nuts like as I was teaching you know my own students and having to sit there and they're constantly looking for the flaws and I'm like no tell me what's good like look for the good in this tell me what you like about it uh, instead of telling me like what you think is bad or what could be changed like we can talk about that later but I want you to tell me what is good about this one thing that we're like reading or you know, like what did you get from this and I don't think we do that enough. Like we spend so much time, it feels like tearing people down um, through critique where it's like, oh, you said that like libraries can be a good replacement for schools. Well, that's not a full solution. It's like, yeah, I know that's not a full solution. Like I, I'm giving a starting point. Like here's where you could start off with. How do we build from that? And I don't think that we spend a lot of time doing that. We have a, we still have this very systematic way of just being like, hey, I need to tell you what, like, what's wrong with this. And it's like, well, it's not wrong. It's just, it's incomplete. It's not finished. It's, uh, it's a, what is the word I'm looking for? Like, it's something that's continuous. Like, it's not, learning isn't going to be finished. Like, you can't just be done. Like, okay, I've got all the knowledge in my head. I'm finished. I'm out. Bye. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a great point. And I also feel like that kind of ties back to learning being something communal that there's this expectation that individuals have whole answers that can be applied to everyone um when really uh, uh, as you were saying nicole it's like here are some ideas here are some starting points here uh you know personal experience that you can share but of course they're never going to be complete and um people's contexts are very different and there's always going to to, to need to be a diversity of answers and that works the best communally, not with individuals coming up with uh, wholesale plans. That's not very anarchist, I don't think. <laughs> I think it's great it's that you actually mentioned this diversity and even of territories, because I think also that when we are having this conversation, um, I, I think at least I noticed that we have a very, of course, Western <laughs> white perspective. While I'm sure that there's people in other territories that think that Again, that's the Western way of seeing education or seeing learning processes, right? Uh, so in addition to that, to the critique we have had about the interpersonal hierarchies, uh, I think it's also important to actually open for that, not just cultural, but actually for the um, for this diversity we have of knowledges and how we we build them and how we live on everyday basis. Uh, because yes, of course, anarchism is one way, but uh, I've noticed uh, in the last couple of years as well that, you know, I, I knew about other pedagogies that actually overlap a little bit with the way we, we do things, but it might be also a little bit different. And then I'm talking about you know this rural education that is very much used in what it's so-called South America or Abiyala, um, and and uh, or even indigenous communities where they have you know more intergenerational educational processes, uh, and I think that's also important to know, right? That as you said, it's we we are also in different contexts, and the thing is that our we are very much implicated in this globalized Western productive based way of seeing education, like you said, right? I mean, if we, we cannot be sure if we're learning, <laughs> we are not being evaluated and quantified. Well, that's wrong. And that's other, that I, I think that's the only, an, another point that I've seen that people get a little bit, um, that we are so trained to do this, that even in conversations, uh, people seek this kind of validation instead of uh, relying on as Nicole said, in you know, uh, collective reflection, for instance, or, or just going back and say, "Hey, I need a couple of weeks to think about this because, yeah, you know, I need to digest, and I need to um, attach everything we have been talking about with my own, uh, with my own activities, and then see." But, um, but I think also, uh, I, I think. I see a lot of these globalized tendencies uh, in what we want to deconstruct and what we want to abolish, because I think uh, there's a lot of people in the collective that actually I'm sure that they define themselves as abolitionists. 
<laughs> in many ways, either a school abolitionist or an academia abolitionist. Or, but the, the, the thing is that, yeah, how are we going to open for that diversity of radical learning spaces that also will be based on that, uh, that materialism that we also would, would have to use. And um, I think that's what's also the idea, right? When we started with those joyful resistance groups is to know <gasps> what are they doing, you know, in the other side of the world, because I'm sure, you know, it doesn't matter if they call themselves anarchists or not, perhaps, but you know, the practices are liberatory. The practices are revolutionary. The practices are anti-capitalist. So that's the whole point. And I think that, uh, yeah, in, in us, you know, we bear, especially, you know, people train in white systems uh, or Western systems, we bear a lot of responsibility actually, yeah, to deconstruct all these frameworks we are talking about that we internalize. That's the whole problem, right? That in a, in, it, they, are in, they are upon ourselves and it takes time to unlearn. We have had other, podcast about unlearning but but uh, it's it's an important thing because we we are actually indoctrinated to follow these paths to live in hierarchies to believe in expertise to obey not to ask questions not to be critical right so uh, the the important part, uh, thing i at least it would be very enriching to know again what people are doing and how they are doing it not just to and not to criticize that it's not the point, as as Nicole said, but actually knowing okay what is working, how long, what did you do? Uh, we, we'd love to know. And the most important thing we love we'd love again to support each other, not just to so show solidarity as allies because actually at the end of the day that doesn't mean anything, except that those are nice words, but actually to be uh, good comrades in the way that you know we can be we can support each other in our struggles because of course um, i mean I, I live in europe and you can say a lot that we are much more privileged here than in other ways we are colonizers right so yeah not not privileged naturally but yeah colonizers and that's why we have the you know the way of living we do have but again it's very structured it's very authoritarian so I actually, as an anarchist pedagogue, I feel that I have this extra responsibility to break this down because nobody wants it. And actually, if we are going to be a collective, we also need to give space to leave people that are doing wonderful stuff with, with some of the same values that we, that we work with. One of the things that kind of struck me early on when uh, in studying anarchism is that the practice of anarchism is like there is a there's a universal value, right? We want liberation for all, but there is a very particular type of practice for that for anarchism that is specifically uh place based. So we ass we we don't assume that there is an overarching solution for every person everywhere in the world. This is has nothing it's not necessarily about education, it's about all anarchist practices every community needs to decide for itself what its liberation looks like and only by communities being able to from the ground up decide on their own liberation and only by acting in solidarity with others who form their own particular solutions can we actually reach the revolutionary moment that we are looking for and that to me was always a very inspiring part of of anarchist theory and kind of what pushed me towards anarchism from other strands of socialism. All that to say that in education particularly, to assume that a, an expert that doesn't know you, that doesn't come from where you are, that worked elsewhere, can tell you what to do in your particular circumstance is just not only objectively problematic, but also from an anarchist ethic, a huge problem. And when, when, when we in this collective have worked with people with practitioners and asked to learn about what they do. And we've done that a few times. And I'm very, I feel very fortunate that we had those conversations. Uh, little tree that we mentioned was one of them, but there are others. It wasn't so that we can go, oh, they're doing it there. Let me just copy, do it here. It was rather to learn about their experience and to, to learn a set of questions that we could ask ourselves. One thing that was really inspiring to me about talking to a lot of these educators is that 
they you know we, we we are definitely as sonia as you said we're definitely in like a western system and we we have a lot of unlearning but we also have a lot of institutions that we are resisting but also kind of have to live with for now and one of the things that i've learned from all these examples was how people in different places learn where the loopholes are where they can operate where they find the caveats of the system not to say that they're the holes that they have are the holes that i have they're not it's very different situations but to say that they have they have looked at it and they found the holes which gave me inspiration enough to look for holes in my particular circumstance and the only real way for us to move forward in anarchist education i think is by learning from each other's examples not to copy each other but to learn a sort of set of critical questions critical modes of of study of of intrigue of being curious about our own predicament so that we can create our own particular solutions. And those might look like mistakes to others, falling back on what Nicole said. Those that might look like mistakes to others, but they might be the only reasonable thing that we can do in our own situation. One of the things that I've, that, that, that have been very, very important to me or very influential to me here is that I currently work in Canada, which is not where I come from. And here we are very much, if we want to do a, a good educational practice from a revolutionary perspective, we have to think about indigenous rights. We have to think about indigenous practices. We have to think about indigenous knowledge. That is something that I've never considered, was never part of my vocabulary and has to be here. There's no way to do good education here. There's no way to do good learning here without that. And I have to do it. And it's great that I have to do it, but I can only, but in the very specific way that I that we can do it here, we cannot do it elsewhere. And it's really important to notice that that particularity, but also to learn from other particularities in the sense of how do I learn about my own space? And how do I create the practices that are good for my own particular circumstance? No, I definitely like I agree with that. Because like, having the like, again, looking at Little Tree, because they did talk a bit about their um like the legal structure because I, I think we did ask them about that i'll be sure to put the like the presentation they did um in our show notes for this one but as well as anything else that we've mentioned but like when they were talking about it, they're talking about all these little like little legal loopholes where it's like oh like our students come to us they're with us uh through the whole year and their parents just have to sign off that they're like what on vacation or something of that nature where it's like they're just you know, they're, they're not in the country. They can't be in a, a, you know, like a traditional school or something. And like they can be registered here and they go to school here and so on. And so they just have to find these kind of little legal loopholes. And it's also just about like, you know, kind of, I think first, a lot of people don't actually know what the laws are where they live. Like I've only vaguely kind of learned a lot about Slovakia's laws because I, I mean, like I live here, so I kind of have to, um, but like, you know, trying to figure out, okay, so like the state has a very tight control over what kinds of schools it'll allow. It doesn't even really allow any more Waldorf schools because like uh, we have one and then they decided that it was not up to standards. And so we can't have more than that. So it's like, all right, how do we get around this? If the state has such a tight control over what education looks like or what schools are or where kids can learn. Um, just focusing on kids for the moment and it's like how do we get around that and it's kind of like okay could we do like summer camps and so I start looking at things um, like budding roses over in like Portland where it's like can I actually you know could I make something similar with like that can I work with anarchists here who could help build something like that which is actually something that like not this year but like next year I'm like maybe if I'm still here hopefully um, I would like to be but, you know, like maybe I can work with like anarchists in the area and start building like these summer camps where kids can come in and start learning very self-directed, uh, not learning, but, you know, like building up um, an understanding of like self-directed education and being exposed to it and having access to that and kind of, you know, doing all that. And it's still it's going to require making a lot of mistakes because, you know, if it's something new, you have to make a mistake in order for something to happen for you to learn how to build it um, with everyone else, of course. But it's like you have to go through those kind of like growing pains and like definitely that whole idea of the legal loopholes and like figuring out how to like sneak through systems and, um, you know, maybe not 
100% adhere to that system, but because we don't want to do that, but, you know, trying to find the ways that we can actually build while these, unfortunately, these systems are in place that we can't just like immediately go, okay, I'd like to just like demolish you. Goodbye. Um, <laughs> you know, like it, that has been like kind of inspiring seeing people do that. No, perhaps it would be also great to, you know, let people know that we'd love to continue doing the same. Now we are having a, quite a little bit of, of a break after the the first festival we have had. Uh, but, you know, the, the Discord channel is open always and the people can always contact us because we will keep on trying, you know, to have activities uh, and getting to know what, yeah, what others in the collective would like to, you know, work with. Uh, because that's another thing that it's important, the collective. I mean, we cannot just sit in the coordinating group deciding <laughs> the activities in ourselves. That's why we did the festival because, you know, again, it was there was a lot of examples of how people understand anarchist uh, pedagogies. Uh, and it was great to know, you know, from different uh, experiences but this is what we actually would love to you know continue doing and uh, and again we have the the discord ser server when you know where it would be very nice to continue the conversations in the fall having sessions where we can talk you know and 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 build together that would be nice yeah so if you're listening to this right now and you're not of the one of the four people who are actually in the room <laughs> If you're listening to us right now in our as, as this podcast episode comes up um, and you have ideas and you want to share them, reach out to us. It doesn't have to be a podcast. It can be. It can be other things. We are very open to this. We are creating stuff that we feel might help others. But if you have other ideas on how this can be done, hey, we're, we're very open to this. And hopefully this is a chapter one of at least two. At least two that I know of maybe there are others as well um thanks everyone this was lovely <laughs>